Hi everyone, this is the Chuta Baba from Nightlight Astrology, and today I'm sitting down to give you a few chart demonstrations. Now I'm doing this in order to promote some of my programs that are starting in June. I'm going to give you a horary chart demonstration today, and um, I'll tell you a little bit about what horary is and how you can learn more about that class afterward if you're interested. I'm also going to do a natal chart demonstration today in um, preparation for my upcoming class, Ancient Astrology for the Modern Mystic, which is a one-year course on ancient Hellenistic astrology. So. Um, both of these forms of astrology, ancient Hellenistic astrology and horary astrology, tend to be a little bit more predictive. But there's always a counseling element and a human element where we're not just predicting things, but helping people to um, understand what's happening around them and to sort of navigate life's um, different seasons as intelligently as possible. So uh, in this case, let's start with a horary question that I received recently. Now, this question came from uh, a man who was wondering if his novel would be accepted for publication or not. So um, a horary question is a kind of a yes or no or an outcome-based question that's asked to an astrologer by any old person. And when, let's say me as the reader, when I receive that question, I look at the time, I take the time stamp, and I cast the chart for the moment of that question from my location. Now, it's like a birth chart for a question. Then I take a look at the, um, I assign the signifiers so that planets represent the different moving parts of the question. And then there's a series of techniques that we use that are thousands of years old that uh, we look at in order to determine the answer. So it's a more highly, usually very predictive form of astrology. Sometimes people will ask whether it's advisable to do something or not. But generally speaking, the questions are like this question, which was, will my novel be accepted for publication? So in this case, let's start off with assigning our signifiers. <clears throat> the main signifier is the querent, the person asking the question. And that is given to us by the ruler of the ascendant, which in this case is Mars. So Mars is going to represent our querent. Now we have to also look at um, the moon. The moon will oftentimes represent the querent as well. Uh, then what we do is we look towards uh, what is going to represent the uh, either the book or in this case, the publishing house or the whoever has the decision, will they decide to accept or not? Now, in this case, this person happened to know the uh, publisher and uh, this publisher is part of a larger body, uh, uh, like a authoritative body that has the power to say yes or no, accept or reject. So we're going to give that to the 10th house. The 10th house ruler is the sun in this chart. So we have the sun representing the deciding body. Now, here's how I judge the question. First of all, we want to look and see how does the deciding body feel about the book or about the person? Well, it turns out that in this case, the creative project is also represented by Mars, who is the fifth house ruler. So Mars is going to represent both our querent and the book. And what we want to know is how does the publishing house or this group of people who are making the decision, the decision feel about the book? Well, in the sign of Taurus, the publishing house or the group of body deciding this uh, upon whether or not this novel will get published is in Taurus, which is the detriment of uh, Mars. On the other hand, Mars, who the book or our querent is in Aquarius, which is the detriment of the sun. So they don't feel great about when each, with one another. It's not an incredibly great sign. On the other hand, uh, we also have to look for aspects, which means planetary connections that could show the connection of the book and the publishing house coming together, which would be a great indication of success if it's a good aspect. The lack of reception is concerning right away, though. It gives us a sense that they may not be crazy about this particular book, even if the person's talented. Maybe it's just not a match for them, as is the case with lots of publishing houses. People who have ever had an agent we'll know that lots of times publishing houses will be like, great book, not for us, not what we're trying to sell right now. So we'll see what happens, right? But right off the bat, that reception is room for pause. Just say, hmm, doesn't look good right away, but let's see what happens. Well, do we see any aspect connecting the sun to uh, Mars? And the answer is yes, we see uh, what is called a contra antitia. And that is forming not in, in not too long. Uh, when these two planets at their degrees in Taurus and Aquarius add up to 30 collectively, then it'll be in a contra antitia. So that's coming up pretty soon because the sun is moving towards, you know, say 
like right now, if it were to be a contra antitia, the sun would need to be at about 13 degrees, while Mars is at 17 for the two bodies to add up to 30, in which case you get this traditional aspect called a contra antitia. Um, they're not there, but the sun is applying toward that degree. And as Mars moves along uh, further, they get closer together in that antitia as well. So they are forming a contra antitia. A contra antitia is a form of opposition. Now, sometimes it has a secretive connotation to it, uh, but in this case, it is um, an opposition. And so the opposition is not a favorable aspect. And typically in this case, with the lack of reception and the poor opposition is going to be a no. So you can see this question was asked on April 21st, and I heard back today from this person that they received a no. So that's an unfortunate one. Uh, but, you know, when an astrologer sees this and says, you know, hey, look, don't, don't lose hope, you know, this place may not say yes, but that might just mean that the destiny of this book isn't in the hands of this place. And then you actually see that it plays out in that way. Um, at least my experience of doing horary is that can actually be an encouraging thing rather than getting discouraged and being like, oh, you know, I have bad luck. It's just like, no, this just wasn't the destiny. It wasn't the destiny for the book to be with this publisher, but keep going. Don't stop if you love writing. You know what I mean? So um, sometimes that takes the edge off as opposed to being like, oh, you know, they must hate me or it must have sucked or something like that. It's just like the horary is just like, you know, just, just doesn't look like it's the destiny for this particular, this isn't just, this just isn't the match. And that can be relieving. So anyway, that's an example from Horary, which I thought you guys might find interesting. I've been promoting my classes lately and Horary is coming up in the middle of June. So if you find that interesting and you already know how to read aspects and you have an awareness of the house meanings and dignity, uh, you're ready to jump into Horary. It's a steep learning curve, but it's really fun. We do a lot of live charts in class, so check it out. Early bird rate right now is $500 off. There's a 12-month payment plan. We have need-based tuition for people who need help, and uh, that includes anyone who's struggling from the uh, due to the coronavirus. All right, so <clears throat> I'm going to now switch over to a natal chart and just show you a couple of cool things from my natal chart practice, um, which is primarily my primary practice. So I'm going to show you a couple of things that showed up in the reading. And these are examples of things that I, using Hellenistic astrology techniques, I had written down on my sort of short list of things to talk about with this client. And some of the specific predictions that were either totally on point or very close to on point, uh, just using these classical methods. It's really cool. And again, the main way that I, the main reason I like to illustrate this for people is just to show people that what you're learning when you study Hellenistic astrology is a kind of, um, it's a kind of predictive approach to astrology. And in this course, I call it ancient astrology for the modern mystic because we're marrying this ancient predictive approach to, you know, modern counseling, psychological astrology. And the synthesis is really nice. So anyway, uh, let's take a look. Now, first of all, uh, what stands out in this chart to me when I first look at it? Well, the thing that catches my eye right away is planets that are angular, especially in the ascendant, which was given a lot of importance in ancient astrology. And here we have Saturn. Now it's a daytime chart, which makes Saturn a little bit better, but Saturn in the first house is almost always a challenge of some kind. It can mean, for example, that a person has obstinate or stubborn or, you know, is in some ways um, tends to be uh, more, let's say, uh, pent up or has that just kind of Saturnine um, restrictiveness around their personality. Um, but not always. Uh, sometimes, you know, Saturn is a sign of the hermit or the melancholic, and those people are often quite romantic and poetic and uh, maybe sometimes reclusive, or they might like to be isolated. These were all things that ended up being true about her personality. But more specifically, when Saturn's in the first house, you always have to look for the potential for illnesses or ailments. Well, in this chart, we have another testimony to the potential for uh, pretty serious or challenging physical health because the moon, which is the natural planetary significator of the body in ancient astrology, is also entering into an opposition with Mars, who is the malefic that is contrary to sect in this chart. Uh, during a daytime chart, Mars tends to become a little extra hot and fiery, not the nicest character. And so the moon here reflecting the body, moving into an opposition with Mars, most difficult aspect with a malefic, both point to the potential for serious uh, ailments. 
in this case, our client had a um, was born with a condition that gave them a disability from birth that they had to learn how to work with uh, over their whole life and are still dealing with today that really set them apart, kind of marked them with that Saturn stigma of being the outsider or being different, something that Saturn referred to in ancient astrology. And also um, just, you know, it was, you know, sort of an ongoing thing that they had to learn how to grow up with. They had to learn in different ways and so forth. So um, that was one of the predictions that was at the top of my list and check that box in the reading. And it's really cool to see that with a client, not that you're sitting there dreaming like, oh, how, how impressive can I be getting things right? But just to see that astrology has such specific predictive value, you can really see what a person's, you know, what a person's coming in with, what kind of karma they're dealing with. So that was one of the predictions. The next one that I made, and I made a bunch, but I'm just going to kind of sum up ones that I think are kind of the most interesting. Another one that I made was that uh, the mother might be intense or there might be a certain degree of quarrel or intensity with the mother. And we see that based on the fact that the moon is, again, moving into an opposition with Mars and moon is going to be mother. Well, sure enough, mom was quite a fiery character that this person, uh, although they still love and have a relationship with, uh, really struggled with due to mom's intensity and really extreme anger. So that's a moon opposite Mars. And uh, that was, at the, again, one of the predictions that I wrote down uh, that was really relevant in ter terms of just kind of unpacking this this client's life and, and getting into some of this stuff together. So that one was um, pretty spot on. And then here's one more that I think is really neat. So you've got a couple of signs in this chart that there might be some kind of really nice inheritance from the father or from the family. Here's how you look at that. First of all, we've got the lot of fortune in the fourth house, which is the house of the father traditionally, or the house of the family and parents in general and family wealth. A lot of fortune there means that there's a real emphasis on whatever it is that the the house has to give. There's a real and real deep form of inheritance there. But what is it? Good or bad? Money? What? I mean, what kind of inheritance? Well, then for that we look at the sun, and uh, we see that the sun is in the eleventh house, which was traditionally the house of acquisition, the joy of Jupiter, the house of friends, benefactors, benefits, and we see the ruler of that house, the sun, who is also the natural planetary representative of the father in that house of acquisition. And uh, so we got more evidence that maybe dad is an ally in life. Dad blesses us with something or dad blesses the client with something, I should say. And then um, you can see that the sun in turn in this chart is hosted by Jupiter in its own domicile in a daytime chart, which makes it the benefic of the sect, really powerful, good stuff that typically comes from the benefic of the sect. And Jupiter is in its own domicile, strengthened by being in its own sign in the eighth house of inheritance. And what do you know? Jupiter is also sees the lot of fortune by a trine. Okay, now there is Mars in the eighth house as well. But uh, one of the things that I said was, uh, you know, again, top of my list of um, predictions for this potential for this particular chart was the potential for family or father or land from family and father, because the fourth house also represents land, to benefit the native or to be some kind of big blessing, maybe through father's death, which is also associated with the eighth house, death and inheritance, but in general looked like it could be uh, really a blessing. So in this case, this person was in the real estate industry when their father died and left them a good amount of um, money with which they were able to invest in a number of properties and have been able to, um, you know, sustain themselves off from the um, profits that came from the properties that they were able to buy through their inheritance from their father. So that was another really specific um, thing that has played a really big role in this person's life because when that happened, this person also started going, hmm, if I don't really have to work anymore, uh, you know, or not as much, uh, what's my purpose? What am I doing? What really brings me passion in life? And so these became really vital components of our, you know, our conversation. So at any rate, uh, really beautiful to see the Hellenistic techniques at work. And again, usually when I sit down, I may have 15 or 20 ideas that I see in the chart as potential plot lines or really important points in a person's life story. Um, and we, you know, as, as I go along and kind of go through those with the client, it's really cool to see, you know, which pieces hit. And sometimes if a, if a prediction doesn't hit, it's really, really close. So for example, let's just say that I got something wrong in this chart. I'll make one up. So let's say I had said, you know, it looks like mom relationship with mom could be rough. And she says, oh no, you know, um, relationship with mom was fine. And I go, oh, how about your siblings? And they say, yeah, I had a really rough relationship with my brother or with my sister or whatever the case might be. 
then we're, we're, oh, okay, I see. Because the moon is the ruler of the third house, whole sign cancer, ruler of the third house of siblings. So moon represents siblings as well and is opposing Mars. Oh, okay, it was your siblings you had a rough time with. So over time, you'll learn to say something like, I'm seeing the moon has this opposition to Mars. Here are some of the different things it could represent. Maybe some an intense mother or hostility or conflict with mother. Moon also rules siblings in your chart. So maybe it could have something to do with siblings, right? You could even make another specific prediction in this chart, which would see, for example, this house as the first. And then when you count around the wheel from the first to the opposition to Mars, you get to the seventh. Then what you're saying is, oh, well, if the moon rules siblings and the moon is opposite Mars in the seventh from the, from the house that the ruler of siblings is in, maybe then what we're saying is that there is some kind of natural uh, opposition that the spouses face in their marriages. Because I'm looking at the uh, ruler of the place of siblings and then counting off seven places from that place to get to the place of marriage relative to the ruler of siblings, something like that. So ancient astrologers had a lot of these kind of interval, numeric, esoteric counting methods that could also play into a reading, which would be really cool. And so you always are working off from a list of different possibilities. It's kind of like one of those, you go to the doctor's office or the, I mean, the, um, what is it, the optometrist, the eye doctor, and they flip all of those different lenses over your eyes. Now, how about this? Now, how about this? Do you see the letters there, right? Click, click, click. It's like that, but it's like a lot crazier set of goggles that we have on. We're always flipping the lenses. And you start to see patterns when you use all of these ancient techniques, and then you start to reduce them down to the most likely potentials. Um, anyway, so hopefully you thought that some of this was cool. Uh, my course, Ancient Astrology for the Modern Mystic, is coming up starting in mid of June. It's a big class because we've really opened the floodgates with COVID-19 and really trying to give, some, give people something to invest themselves in spiritually right now. Uh, we've got need-based tuition for people who need it. So it's going to be a bigger class than usual. Um, but that being said, uh, early bird rates still available, payment plans there, need-based tuition is there. 30 classes on the year, 12 guest lectures additionally. Uh, a lot of theory in the beginning and philosophy, spiritual philosophy of ancient astrology. And then the last lessons we go into a lot of practice live in class and uh, live clients as well. So uh, there's a certification track you can take. There's optional quizzes, homework, reading, bonus material for every lecture. We have an online forum on Facebook that we converse in all year round as well. So I hope to see some of you there. If you have any questions, again, feel free to email me, Nightlight Astrology or info at nightlightastrology.com. And uh, yeah, hopefully I'll see some of you in class soon. Take it easy.